battleground, we're gonna win the battle in our mind today with something we don't talk about a whole lot. Um, we're a prideful nation. We're prideful people. And, uh, and that definition is um, usually looked at in a positive light. And sometimes pride might, be not the, might not be the greatest term because pride in the Bible is looked at negatively. It's, it's not a, it, it never has a good connotation. And so, um, so we're gonna learn how to win this battle in our minds because I want you to be successful, but I, want you, I don't want you to deal with pride. And too often times in our culture, we find the two go hand in hand. But the church can be successful and not be prideful. Amen? We can, we can be successful and humble at the same time. And we're going to learn that this morning. All right? You ready? Why don't you stand to your feet? Second Chronicles chapter 26. We're going old school in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles chapter 26, we'll start in verse one. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elith and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jecoliah, and she was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. You should underline that, rip that out of your Bible and put it on your refrigerator. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. So he went to war against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jeb, Jebna and Ashdod. He rebuilt the towns near Ashdod and elsewhere in the Philist among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbal and against the Meganites. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he became very powerful. Look at your neighbor says, this guy's got a really popular YouTube channel. His fame spread everywhere because he had become very powerful. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, in the valley gate, and at the angle of the wall. He fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug up many cisterns. Because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain, he had people working in his fields and vineyards and hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Uzziah had a well-trained army ready to go out by divisions according to the numbers as mustered by Jeel, the secretary of Messiah, the officer of the direction, under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. The total number of the family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. Under their command was an army of 307,500 men trained for war, a powerful force to support the king against his enemies. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made devices invented to use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that the soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls. His fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. But after his eye became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary for you have been unfaithful and you will not be honored by, by the Lord your God. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. And while he was raging at the priests in, the, in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead and they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, 
leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. Father, we ask you today. God, we pray that you'd help us in our minds not to think too highly of ourselves. God, you'd help us win the battle. The success wouldn't turn out as poison in the end. We pray, God, that we would humble ourselves before you. We would submit ourselves to your will today, Lord. And we realize that you're the source of all that we have and all of our success. Thank you, God, for your patience with us this morning. We pray that because we came together, we'd be changed in your presence. Thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray and everyone said, amen and amen. You may be seated. I, um, one of the things about life is that um, you, act, you have a choice to be prideful or humble. It's your choice. And, um, and, and, and it seems like the more success we pile up, the harder it is to be humble because you end up at the end knowing what you're doing. And there's, there's, there's no better way to, to humble us, I almost said humiliate. There's no better way to humble us than to, for, for us to put ourselves in positions that we're not familiar with. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Um, one of the things, let, let me back up a little. There, there's two secret jobs I wish I could have. Are you, are you ready for them? Okay, the first one is this. Every time my wife and I or the kids or whoever go to Waffle House, I secretly wish I could be the cook. <laughs> that is not, I, my, I've discussed this several times with my wife sitting there. I'm like, dude, I could do that. That is so awesome. But I would do it hibachi style, like I'd be spinning eggs on a thing and flipping them and, you know, tossing, I don't know, tossing hash browns in people's mouths. Um, I just think it's the coolest thing. I think it's a cool thing that you're there, people see you cooking and you interact. You'd be like, hey, Billy, what's up today, man? Yeah, I got your regular going. Um, I just think it's neat. I don't say I want to do it forever. I'd just like to have a job for a while. The second thing is, as I want to be a radio talk show host. I think that's awesome. Here's why. You talk for a long time and you don't have to let anyone else talk. <laughs> you get to dictate what callers come in. And if somebody disagrees with you, you can tell the guy, I'm not talking to them. So you can, it's like your own little world. You don't even know if anybody's listening. It's just, you're like, this is awesome. So in light of that, that's all funny, but this, this what I'm going to tell you now isn't. Um, in light of that, there's a local radio station that I've been on several times, and, and sometimes they, they call me and say, hey, would you come on and talk about this subject? And, um, and sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's not. They texted me Friday, and uh, most of you know that Thursday night there was a tragedy in the south end of Berkeley County, uh, and it was, it's an extremely difficult circumstance. And so I got a text message Friday from, from the people that run that show on the radio station said, hey, would you be willing to come on and talk about it? And uh, my first knee jerk was, I don't even know what to say. That what, what can you say? And so, um, so my second thought was grace and mercy. God is still good. Evil exists in the world, but God will overcome. Amen? Yes. And I think the world needs to hear that. Yes. And so that's, we're going to lead with grace. And so tomorrow morning, if you remember, pray for me around 930. Um, you know, if we're humble, God will exalt us, the Bible says. We will, he, he, will, he will promote us. You can be confident of that. And, and so some, some humbling experiences are when people ask you to do something, you have no idea how you're going to do it or how it's going to turn out. And, th and this is one of those things for me. And uh, I just would covet your prayers tomorrow to make sure that your pastor doesn't say something dumb. Because I know what's going to happen. You're going to be like, oh, I used to go to that church. Yeah. Yeah, you, 
Yeah, we used to go there. Shoot. Like, we haven't been there in a while. <laughs> this kid's 16 years old. He becomes king. That's, rem that's remarkable. Um, he's not the youngest king ever, but that's pretty young. You don't have a pile of life experience at 16. I mean, I know a 16-year-old thinks they do, but you don't have a pile of life experience at 16. But Uzziah did something right off the bat that made him successful at the beginning. It says he sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the favor, in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. I want to ask you this question is are you staying teachable? One of the best ways to combat pride, and pride is simply when you think too highly of yourself. You think you're better, you're better than you really are. And one of the ways to combat that is to stay teachable. Because prideful people typically aren't teachable. Amen? So what happens is we find out that he starts out at 16 years old and he stays in the council of Zechariah. It says he learned from him. When he stayed, he kept hearing from him. What would, what would the Lord have me do? What would the Lord have me do? What would the Lord have me do? And as long as he stayed pliable and teachable, God gave him success. The problem is, is that a lot of us in the room have, have kind of gotten to the place where we know what we're doing. Amen? You've been doing what you've been doing long enough to know what you're doing. And so we get to the place where we think we don't have to ask anybody anymore. When's the last time you asked your wife how she liked it? I've been married long enough, I know. But guess what? I found out that she changes her mind. When's the last time you asked your husband? You don't have to do that. He never changes his mind. He's like, same TV channel tonight. <laughs> Teachable. One of the things that impresses me about, leader, about a leader is a leader who is capable of bringing other people to the table with them no matter how much they know. They're willing to listen to other people no matter how high, how high they've gone. They're willing to bring in, they're willing to invite. Can I tell you something? People telling you what to do and you inviting into your life are two different things. Two different things. I don't want to be to the place where somebody is telling me I have to do it. I want to invite them in before that, before that time gets there. Because if you're in the place where somebody is looking over you, telling you you have to do it a certain way, you've already screwed it up. So I want to be early and invite people into my life to be able to say, hey, did you think about this? Did you think about that? And this construction project, it's so funny. It's so funny. Construction uh, contractors uh, have their own way of doing things. And I've worked around them for a long time. And so in this project, I keep getting people coming to me saying, hey, listen, uh, I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I'm like, dude, we're all wearing steel-toed boots around here. I don't even know what the problem is. They always started with that, and I go, if there's something I'm missing, just tell me. Why would I be worried about you hurting my feelings if I'm going to get hurt anyway? So what you find out is Uzziah was teachable, and as long as he was teachable, God was blessing him. One of the, one of the ways to combat pride in your life is never think you know everything about anything. And always be willing to invite people into your life. Say, hey, listen, hey, listen, you, I, I need to know what you think about this. I need to know. Don't, don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to know. Tell, tell me how you would do it. I, I, I've tried to set up those things in my life with people and say, hey, listen, I, I, I want you to tell me how I should do this. I, I, I want, I, 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 I meet with people almost every month. Uh, the one guy I meet with is moving to Florida and it's going to be hard to fly down there every month. But my wife said we can make that happen. <laughs> I sat in front of him one day and he was telling me a story about another pastor. I just looked up at him. I said, tell me how not to be that guy. And you know what? If you ask people, they will tell you. 
It was remarkable. I was able to sit down with my notepad and Cracker Barrel and just write a bunch of stuff down. Chris, he heading, here's, now, here's how not to be an idiot. Okay, step one. All right, thank you. Step, thank you, thank you. And it was good stuff, but you have to invite it into your life because the issue is when you become successful at anything, people stop giving you advice. You know what the trick is? People start asking you for advice. And if you're not intentional about bringing it into your life, you'll think you're just the guy or the girl that's supposed to give it all the time. Here's what Proverbs says. I think it's a theme. Proverbs 11, 14, for lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fa fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 24, 6, surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. You know what you should have around you? A lot of smart people to help you navigate what you're supposed to do. It says, as long as he was taking godly counsel, he was successful. As long as he sought God, who instructed him in the fear, Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God, as long as he sought the Lord. He was seeking the Lord through him. He was saying, teach me how to do this. Teach me how to seek the Lord. Teach me how to do what God wants me to do. As long as he did that, he gave him success. It's the antithesis of pride. Pride says, I don't need to know. I don't need to know from anyone else. I don't need to hear from anyone else. I know what I'm doing. I've done this before. I've got it. Leave me alone. I'll do my own thing. I'm good enough at this. Uzziah starts out well. God gave him success. It's pointless to have a teacher if you're not going to listen. Let me ask you this. How, how do people know that you're teachable? How will they know if you're teachable? Like, like, do you ever say, I had a teachable moment? Do you ever say, I learned this the other day? Do you ever say, does anybody ever catch you reading a book? I, if you've been at this church, you know, you know that it's not that I'm a bookworm, but you know that I find value in reading books because some, some person screwed it up bad enough to write a book about it. And if they did that, then I could read it and not have to screw it up that bad. But what we do is we don't read it and then we screw it up. Then we write a book about screwing it up. You don't have to fail at everything to be successful. You can get a multitude of teachers around you, whether it's a podcast. Come on, somebody give it up for podcast. So finally, I don't have to read anymore, right? Podcasts, there's audiobooks, there's books. You don't even have to go down to the library. You can just download them on your phone and read it in place of the game you've been playing for the last seven years. Wow, this is brutal. How do I know I'm teachable? I know I'm teachable by the, by the things I've set up in my life. Have I, have, I made, have, I, have I made decisions to read? Have I made decisions to invite people in? Have I made decisions to be teachable? Am I disciplined at being teachable? And the Bible says as long as he was teachable, God gave him success. Now watch this. So the Bible says that he was like his father in, in, his, in the way he honored God. But he was also like his father at the end of his life. So let me read you 2 Chronicles chapter 25, the chapter before the one we just read. When Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Edomites, that's his dad, he brought back the gods of the temple of Seir. He set them up as his own gods and bowed down to them and burned sacrifices to them. Now, do you know how foolish that sounds? The God of all creation gave you a victory over the Edomites. He brings their gods back and he starts worshiping their gods. So the anger of the Lord burned against Amaziah and he sent a prophet to him who said, Why do you consult the people's gods which could not save their own people from your hand? He said, This didn't work for them. And now you're using it. While he was still speaking, the king said to him. Can you read it up there? 
Have we appointed you an advisor to the king? Stop. Why be struck down? Did you, he said, while the prophet was still speaking to him, but I don't know who made you an advisor, but I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to listen to you. While he was still speaking, he said he just interrupted him. You know how I know if somebody's teachable, if they will listen. People that, I, I, I had to make a, can I be transparent with you for a second? I think I'm right a lot. <laughs> Anyone else? Raise your, I know you're out there. Come on, more people than that should be raising their hand. You ain't being honest with God this morning. All of us think we're right. All of us think we're right. And I had to go through a phase in life where everybody else had to hear it. And I actually realized I had to talk to one of my daughters one time. And I said, listen, you don't have to be right about everything. She said, but I am in this case. I said, but you're going to lose friends if you keep acting right about everything. Because if we think we're right about everything, then what we're going to do is we're going to argue our rightness with everybody around us. Don't you love those people? I think it's going to rain tomorrow. No, it's not. I checked on the minute. It's not going to rain. I'm just... Okay, fine. It's your way. Like, whatever. It's frustrating. But we think we're right a lot. And what I had to do was realize, like, I'm not, first of all, right all the time. And the second, even if I am, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. So King, so his dad says he's doing the wrong thing. And when somebody confronts him on it, he's not teachable. He says, ah, uh -uh, don't talk. I'm the king. I don't have to listen to anybody. I don't have to listen to anybody. Who even made you an advisor? Could you imagine the audacity of having a prophet of God come in, in your presence and correct you in a godly manner? And you say, no, no, I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to listen to you. You know what that tells me? I need to listen twice as much as I am. I need to listen twice as much as I am because who knows who God's going to send to me to tell me, hey, listen, buddy, you better wake up a little bit. You better wake up a little bit. Now, I, I also, can I, can I give you a little lesson? Are you listening? This just happened last Tuesday. Pastor Don is in the service. He'll attest to this. I have a rule that everybody should be listeners. The way you're teachable is if you listen. That shows people that you're teaching. So I have a rule. If I'm invited into a meeting, the first time I'm invited to a meeting, I'm not going to say anything. Because I, I, I don't want to come off as somebody that always knows, like, oh, I'm, I'm here, man. I'm going to tell you what I think. So Pastor Don invited me to a meeting last Tuesday in a group of guys. I've never been in this group before. Never been in this group. They're talking about things that I've never discussed in a group like this. So they're talking about it, and I'm sitting there. I got the answer. I mean, I'm, I'm doing math in my head. They're calculating. And I'm, I'm going, man, I could, fi I could almost fix this thing. I could fix half of it right now. Right now. So what I do is this. I know my rule. I'm, I'm going through my head. And I'm like, Lord, are you telling me to break it today? <laughs> like, I want to hear from you, God. Because my rule is just, Chris, shut up and listen. Because at the end of the thing, you may figure out that they got it figured out. <laughs> so what I did was this. I leaned up to Pastor Don and I said, hey, here's what I think. Why don't you raise your hand and tell them? <laughs> and he said, why don't I raise my hand and tell them you got an idea? And I said, no, don't do that. <laughs> so we talked about it on the way home. But you know what? I'm learning that me being teachable is more important than being right. Yeah. And if I'm in a, in, a group, group, in, a, in a room with a group of guys who are, who are, the majority of them are 20 years older than me, it might be time for me to just shut up for a while, mm -hmm. unless I'm called upon. Just be quiet. The first step to teachable is being, being somebody that'll listen. So Uzziah, for the first part of his for the first part of his reign, he's teachable. He's listening to the prophet. And when his dad got to the end of his, 
He stopped being teachable. The prophet walks right in and says, listen, what you're doing is not right. He says, I don't even know who invited you in the room. Get out. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I can't tell you how important it is for, especially if you're young in this room, stay pliable, stay teachable. Don't look at your parents as just old people don't know what they're doing. They can still punish you. <laughs> Embrace it. Invite Invite people into your life that will tell you things you don't want to hear. Hey, man, you're not doing that right. Who made you my advisor? What? No, no, no. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for saving me from the heartache that was coming. You got to be teachable. We have to stay that way. The other thing it says about it, and I love this. I absolutely love the way the way the Bible explains this. It says in verse 15, his fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped. Oh. You know what the most dangerous thing about success is? Is that we think we did it. There's a pride that wells up in us, right? When we get to a certain point in life where your kids are making it happen and you've got some success built up at work and you get up in the morning and you go... I did this. I did this. I deserve it all. I did it, man. I'm, I'm just good. I'm, now, I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but here's the thing. How many times in our, in our daily walk do we go through giving God credit for anything that's happening? It says he became famous and popped like his fame spread through all because he was greatly helped. I love that. As a matter of fact, wouldn't that be a great epitaph on your, on your tombstone? Here's a man who accomplished great things because he was greatly helped. He didn't do it on his own. It wasn't all his idea. It wasn't, he's, he didn't save himself. He didn't deliver himself. He was helped. He was greatly helped. Can I say this to you? You know that pride is showing up if you're going to need credit for it. Here's my philosophy. If you need credit for it, don't do it. If you need credit for it, don't do it. Like, well, I need somebody to recognize that I'm doing this. Why? The God who gives promotions, who rises people up and puts people down, sees everything. So whether your lame boss sees it or not doesn't matter. <laughs> if I need credit for it, just forget about doing it. Well, I need somebody to, some of the most frustrating times in my life, even in this church when I was young, was I felt like I was doing things and nobody was paying attention. I felt like I was doing things and nobody was, nobody cared, nobody. And that was Satan going, hey, Chris, you need credit for it, man. You're better than that. You, people should be watching you. People should be looking at you. You, you should be getting positioned. You should be doing, and it was all live Satan. To say, you're better than you think you are. You're better. You're thinking better of yourself. And I realized that I really wasn't that good. So here we are. Well, if I'm going to do it, I need somebody to pay attention. That's a pride of life. I need, I need credit for it. I need somebody to tell me that I'm good. I need... <laughs> I was watching a TV show the other day. And the guy said, um, I don't really don't need people to like me. He said, it's not like I need people to praise me. He said, I don't need people to like me, but I need people to praise me. That's prideful. Ephesians 3.20. We're going to read this together. This is a verse Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus that tears down every idea that I'm successful by my own hands. Ephesians 3.20, are you ready? Can you read it with me? Now to him. Okay, wait, let's not go any farther. Now to him. Now you know how stupid that sounds now to me, who is able to do immeasurably? That's the way we live our life. Pride comes in and we live our lives, we breathe every word now to me. But the reality is, is we say now to him, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power 
Obviously not the power on the screen. <laughs> according to his power, there we go. According to his power that is at work within us. So there is a power that works within us that is not from us. So at the end of the day, if we're successful, we have been greatly helped. The Bible says, it's not by works that any man should boast, but it's a gift of God. God's grace got you where you are. I'm not saying hard work didn't play a part. I'm not saying you honoring God didn't play a part. in. But it's why the thing that should have killed you didn't kill you. It's why the thing that should have ruined your business didn't ruin your business. Why the thing that should have put you out didn't put you out. It's because his grace lifted you. It's that Romans 8, 20, all things work together for good to those that love God according to his purpose. It's the grace of God that is moving all the things that I could have screwed up and messed up and other people did. It's the grace of God that got me to where I am today. Day. It's a reason you didn't get caught. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. If you're like me, there were so many times that I need to look back and go, God, thanks for not letting me get caught. Because if I got caught, it will, I wouldn't be here. If I got caught, I wouldn't be here. If I got caught doing stupid stuff in college. Stealing Christmas trees. I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> Think about it. We are greatly helped. It's to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. All right. Here's the problem. Let me explain this. Uzziah started at 16. Said he, it said he was king 54 years. What I want to make sure you understand this morning is pride doesn't jump on you all at once. You don't wake up in the morning after you pass your first test in high school and go, I know everything. No, it takes a while and it just builds up and you, and, and success is so intoxicating and it builds up and you go, man, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm, I'm good. People are starting to notice. Can you imagine? Uzziah, I'm, do, you, do you know I heard in Egypt they heard about me? All the way in Egypt, they heard about me. You know, I've got a military of 300,000 men. I built fortresses. I, I even invented things that they could shoot arrows off of towers. Nobody's ever done that. And it's just this little sneaky thing that over success after success after success, we forget how we got there. And then all of a sudden, I built it. I did it. They know me in Egypt. They know me all over. They know me. They know me. They know me. And all of a sudden, we become powerful. And then the downfall is that we act powerful. We act powerful. Uzziah's downfall was he didn't think he needed any correction at any time. He was acting all powerful. Matthew 20, 20 starts a story that I've told here a, a whole bunch of times. I just think it's a great description of how we, how we crave after power in position. And Jesus said, that's not the way this works. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is, what is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and on the other on your left in your kingdom. Give them some power. Give them some success here, Lord. He says, you don't know what you're asking for, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm, that I'm going to drink? We can. They answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit on my right or the left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said they were getting in a fight about who was going to be the most powerful. He called them together, had to correct the whole pride thing immediately. He had to correct the whole power thing immediately. He said, listen, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. He said, even when you receive power, don't act like it. Did you see Jesus going around and go, oh, you're not going to talk to me that way. He was the most powerful person to ever walk the earth. 
He could speak to a fig tree and it would dry up in an instant. The Bible says, by him all things were created, without him nothing was created. He spoke everything into existence and yet he never wielded it one time. Think about it. He never flippantly got upset with somebody and went, I'm not putting up with that anymore. He was the most gracious human being to ever walk the earth. And yet when we get power, we tend to act like it, don't we? And so he corrects the disciples right there. He says, listen, listen, that's not the way we do this. You know that they lorded over them. You know that they exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead of whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He said, if you walk around acting powerful, you're going to miss the whole thing. Some of you have heard this statement. There's a historian and moralist in 1887 that kind of started this statement, and we paraphrase it now. His name, his short name, he had a really long name, was, was Lord Action. That sounds like a superhero. Lord Action. He expressed his opinion in a letter to Bishop Mandel Crichton in 1887. He said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He said, great men are almost always bad men. Think about that. It's the trickle of success. And it's even the trickle of God-given success that can steer us wrong. It's, it's amazing that God's goodness in our life, what we can do with it and how it can corrupt us even. Look at the United States. Look at the culture we live in. The goodness of God has been dumped out on this country in bucketfuls. Amen. And we mishandle it because of the pride. Because of, we know what we're doing. We don't need to submit to God's authority. We know how to handle this. I, I, don't, I don't need to handle money like God tells me to. I can handle it. I don't need to handle my marriage like God tells me to. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to handle my, I know what I'm doing. And it creeps in, it creeps in, it creeps in. We turn 20, we turn 30, we turn 40, and it, and it just creeps in little by little by little. And then before you know it, we're taking, we're taking credit for everything that has happened. We're acting powerful. We're not acting like servants or slaves. We're acting powerful. The way to be pride is to never act like that. At the end of the day, pride will cause you to think you are more than you really are. Here's Uzziah's downfall. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. He entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. Can you imagine this? The priests surrounded himself with 80 other, and they said they were courageous. This guy had built up a mighty force at his beck and call. And now there's 81 priests getting ready to walk in the door and go, hey, bro, you're not doing it right. That takes some guts right there. So they walk in. You notice he's not inviting them in anymore. He's not teachable. He's let the trickle of pride come into his life. And now he's not teachable. Now he's not inviting correction. Now he's not inviting counsel. He's just doing whatever he wants. I've built this whole kingdom and now I'm going into the now I'm going into burnt incense on my own. Eighty other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That's for the priest. The descendants of Aaron who have been consecrated to burn incense, leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Here's his response. He had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense. Can I just say this? Even if you're already in the act, if the correction comes, put the thing down. Don't let pride cause you to walk through it anyway. Just put it down. If, you, if you're doing something wrong and, and God gives you the grace to bring somebody in your life to correct you, oh, you're right, man. You're right. I'm going to put that down. But you know what we do? I'm already in this. I got my censer, and I'm going to burn me some incense, whether you're here or not. Because I'm the king. I'll do what I want to. Do you see all that I've done? Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple. 
leprosy broke out on his forehead. Here's what pride do, does to us. It causes us to follow through with sin to the point that God corrects us. And I don't know about you, but I'd way rather have people correct me. It's always, nobody can give me leprosy. None of the priests could be like, Poof, you got leprosy. That was a, all the priests went, whoa. Matter of fact, they were shocked. It says they grabbed him and hurried him out of the building. Now watch the turn of his mentality. It said he was happy to get out. Because the punishment had already come. I'm praying to God that as a church, we can avoid that whole scenario. Don't let pride build up in our lives to the point where God has to correct us and then everybody sees it. Oh, you, you haven't realized that's the way church happens over the years, have you? We get too prideful. We get too big for our britches. And then God corrects us in front of everybody. And then people say, I knew that church wasn't as good as they thought they were. We can avoid it. We can avoid it. We can accept God, man, I want to hear from you. I want to bring people. I don't, I'm not bigger than I think I, Lord, I need you to guide me and direct me. I don't know what I'm doing. I still don't. I've been doing this 50 years. If it was I had just said, Lord, thank you for all that you've done through me. And I want to make sure I'm in the right place with you. Send me a prophet to make sure I'm in the right place with you. Just send me some counsel. Instead, pride filled his heart and he raged against the instruction God was giving him. It's a diametrically opposed to how he started out. If you think you're better than you are, you'll end up in places you were never meant to be. I'm going to read that again. If you think you're better than you are, you'll end up in places you were never meant to be. It's funny how all of a sudden we stack up a little success and we think we, now we can tell everybody uh, what to do. You know what's funny to me? It's how people with no background in another area of life can have success in one area of life, but then become an expert in everybody else's business. Be careful. Be careful. Pride will ultimately separate us. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and banned from the temple of the Lord. Doesn't have to happen. This man was wildly successful, famous, and at the end of his life, pride wells up within him. He takes credit for what God did through his life, and he does the wrong thing, and he lives separated from the house of God, separated from his people, separated, living by himself with leprosy. But I want to encourage you at the end. Will you let me do that? I want to encourage you at the end. Why don't you stand up? The band's going to come. I want to encourage you that this is what God promises. 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and clothed with humility. Remember, teachable. Be submissive to one another. Don't act like you're powerful. All of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud. When pride wells in up our life, we're literally an enemy of God. He's in opposition to you. But he doesn't stop there. And I'm glad for that. But he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, hum humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You know what my prayer is for this church? That in humility, God would exalt us. That we never lose track that we've been helped. And that the reason we are where we are is because God has helped us and he's promoted us. That we don't have it all figured out. That, we, that we're, we're, not the, we're not the end all, be all. We're, we're, not, we, we're not the smartest people in the room every time. But God has helped us. And the Bible says, in our humility, he will exalt us. You know what my prayer is for you today? Is that in your humility, God would exalt you. 
in your humility, as you, as you invite people, godly people, into your life to speak into it, as you inquire of God, as you, as you Lord, I need help, I need help, that, that you'd find yourself being exalted. Because that's his promise to you this morning. If we will win the battle of pride in our minds, he says he will exalt us. He will exalt us. So Father, we ask this morning, we ask that we take every prideful thought captive unto the obedience of Christ. So that we recognize that you have helped us. That we recognize that your grace and mercy has brought us where we are today. Lord, that we recognize that your goodness was offered to us when we didn't deserve it. That it wasn't by our hands. It wasn't, it wasn't by our works so we could boast about it, but it was your grace. So we thank you this morning, Lord, and we pray, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we'd be able to take those thoughts captive and we'd be able to humbly walk in your will, walk in your way, Lord. And Lord, at the end of the day, that you would exalt us, God, that you would promote us, that you would give us victory, that you would give us success, Lord, that you would give us a place, God of influence, but Lord, never let us lose sight that it was through you, that that same power that raised Christ from the dead, it dwells in us, and it's your power in us doing these great things. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, church, could you honor him? Could you thank him for the good things he's done in here?